Hello, I'm David Hunt, CEO and founder of the Hyperion Cleantech Group and your host for the Leeds and Cleantech podcast. I'm delighted to have with me today a studio guest talking about none other than sodium batteries, um, Will Tope, Chief Commercial Officer for Leaner Energies. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be here. And uh, it's nice to have a guest who's obviously uh, practical on our doorstep, certainly in terms of 80% of our, our clients are outside of the UK, let alone uh, the, the Liverpool region. So it's yeah, good to have you local. haven't come from far today, so it was nice. Good, good. So th clearly there's a lot to get onto, a lot of excitement, a lot of talk around sodium batteries and other technology and, and, and chemistry. So there's a lot that we can dig into, but I always love to dig into the person first and foremost. Now, we had a brief chat out in Warsaw at the Energy Tech Summit, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about your journey from the dark side to the light, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So my background is in oil and gas, as you mentioned. I'm a chemical engineer by trade, uh, but that only lasted a year. I spent a year at a refinery and then was quickly moved into the commercial and business side mm -hmm. of, uh, of oil and gas, working for ExxonMobil. Uh, moved around all over the place, moved to Houston, lived in Aberdeen for a bit. And then uh, the pivotal moment in terms of my transition happened around three or four years ago when I was moved into the, the trading organization mm -hmm. at ExxonMobil. I was made the bag carrier, which the nice way of saying it is chief of staff, but I was definitely the bag carrier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were looking at how do we build an effective trading organization, looking at what were the assets that were really going to be able to monetize on the volatility that will come. And became naturally curious about these large scale batteries that people were starting right. to connect to the grid at that point. And then really what cemented uh, a conviction in me was that I was looking at these large batteries and observed that what we were doing with them was putting hundreds of thousands of small lithium ion yep. cells, the same cells that we were putting into EVs uh, and then connecting these, these large shipping containers full of them to the grid. And I thought we could probably do something better, right, right. size of tech. And then I also observed the supply chain really become crippled just in a matter of months as EV adoption really took place. Mm -hmm. So as EV adoption hit the inflection point, all different elements of the supply chain to fill those shipping containers got constrained. And I yep. said, okay, there's a huge opportunity. This asset class is real. It's going to make a lot of money, but we need to right size the, the solution. And then took my own view on what were the emerging technologies out there, what were the different technologies that were more right-sized for the purpose at hand, for mm -hmm. grid storage, uh, and, and learned about Lena Energy. Uh, got in touch with the technical founders at that point, and uh, you know, it was fair to say it was a bit of a two-way interview. <laughs> it took, it took a bit of time for me to get off the comfy couch that was, that was oil and gas, but eventually uh, fell in love with the tech, really, really, you know, bought into the team and the the mission at Lena and and jumped aboard and it's been it's been a whirlwind. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about that because a lot of people that that that, that we engage with uh, have come from or are in existing oil and gas or telecoms or automotive sectors and, and think that they want to do something a little bit more impactful by moving into the clean technology sector. So that in itself is a is one leap that you've been through. Talk, but was it you actually looking at that time or did Lena just cross your path or was that a, was it a decision to, to make the transition or just an opportunity that arose? So f first and foremost was the opportunity. It was that personal thesis I developed that mm -hmm. said, okay, something about this space screams disruptive potential. Yep. And um, that little voice in my head said, oh, we, we could do something with this. Uh, then it was that search, which I, I guess the way I'd say is, I started looking at what could be out there mm -hmm. uh, and looking at the different technologies. And then over the course of months, as you're looking for that, uh, Lena was looking for someone to bring in commercial acumen into the business. And so that was the trigger point for a more serious discussion to learn yeah. what Lena was doing. Because that that in itself is a, a leap, but also the thing we've, we talked about previously is the leap from a corporate, and there aren't many corporates bigger than ExxonMobil, uh, to, to, to a, you know, a very small, at that stage, you know, startup in the northwest of England. <laughs> so that in itself is is quite a leap. How have you found that transition from, yes, you know, like chief of staff in a large corporate, traveling the world to, to yeah, being just down the road? Yeah. Um, usually, when you talk to peers, and I have colleagues who've made similar journeys, right? you ask them within the first few months and all they can tell is, all they can tell you is just how amazing, how exciting it is being free of the constraints of a large corporation. And that is true. It is really, it's great yeah. working in a small organization. Uh, 
but you do need to balance that with the fact that you're you do give up a lot of the luxuries you have in a big organization yeah. not only when it comes to your own you know work life balance and and the the various additional benefits you get in a large corporation yeah. like not sitting in the back of the plane when you have to do endless <laughs> business trips um uh, but also just the the luxury of having such a bank strength yeah. of talent and support organizations around you, right? So that so when you decide to do something in a big company, it may take you quite a while to get mm -hmm. to that point where everyone's on board and is like, let's go do that. But once you're at that point, then it's like a whirlwind, yeah, right? Support, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas in a in a small organization, you really have to be looking out far ahead of where you are right now and building back from that to make sure you're ready when when the time is right to, to to make big things happen. Yeah, yeah. We were talking recently, actually, with one of the guests, uh, Dominico Treviso from Danfoss, another massive organization about innovation, how you can create innovation in, in large organizations. And it's not always easy. But like you say, what, what you do have is the advantage of scale Absolutely, and capital yeah. and other things that come with it. So the... the uh, jumping back again to the to the, that transition that you've made, because again, at, you know, within larger organizations, you tend to have a reasonably defined brief, right? And, and in the startup, you tend to wear about a dozen hats if you're lucky. So how is that transition and which hats are you wearing yourself in, in Lena at the moment? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, it's a good observation. I think an anecdote there, which probably um, articulates that, that in practice is, I remember sitting down within the first week or two and I'd come from a very strict business development role in, yep. in, in ExxonMobil, sit down first couple of weeks at Lena and um, our company secretary passing me something. They say, okay, we need you to do a press release on a bit of marketing stuff. And I'm looking at it as like, never in a million years would have ExxonMobil have let me do <laughs> marketing and PR, right? Yeah, yeah. And there you are, you're sat there and it's like, you're looking around, well, actually I can do this better than anyone else in the room, probably, and that's good enough. So you yep. end up, it's not necessarily about being a specialist in each and everything you're doing. Um, but it's about, are you the best placed person at that time yeah. to do it? Okay. And then when you get a bit too full, it's about thinking about when, when's the right time to bring in additional people in. But mm -hmm. if I boil everything down, the one thing that I need to do at Lean and the one part of my role that is, is most critical is making sure that we're always focused on the, the problem and not the solution, right? That's mm -hmm. really the DNA I'm, uh, DNA I'm supposed to bring into Lena. yeah. Yeah, and that's a challenge. Just jump back on that point, actually. I think in, in organizations, and I was, I was speaking at an event in Berlin recently, and um, one of the big oil companies, I won't mention who they were, had a speaker on before, and they literally had a script they couldn't deviate from. And and she was very frustrated, saying, you know, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. I, I, you know, I want to be able to say what I want to say, which, again, is one of the advantages of moving into an organization where you can't quite uh, shoot off from the hip, clearly, but you, you have much more flexibility to stretch yourself and your own skills. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's a double-edged sword because who knows what I'm going to say today that I'll come, <laughs> that's true. come back to regret. But um, uh, yeah, I think there's a huge amount of creative freedom, uh, but also similar to, to the double-edged sword point, it also comes with a immense amount of personal ownership. Mm -hmm. So the decisions you make, you have to live and die by. Yeah. And that means, you know, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not thinking about one thing, maybe I could have done better, or, mm -hmm. or maybe what, what decisions I'm going to have to make next week that I haven't thought of yet. And yeah. it, it does, that's going back to big corporate versus startup. It's an amazing experience, right? It is so rewarding to work in an organization that you're passionate about and you can see the difference it's making uh, week by week and month by month. Yeah. But the flip side is it's way more than a job, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it is, it is a job plus more likely it's it's a lifestyle, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's talk about that again because we're going to move on to the tech. But I, I saw you speaking out at, at obviously in Warsaw at the Energy Tech Summit and you, you, you're clearly genuinely passionate about what you're doing and about the technology and about the, the scope of the future. How is the job transition affected you in that sort of sense? Yep. I am a battery geek, first and <laughs> foremost, right? Like unap unapologetically a battery geek. And when I'm not working, I'll find myself on LinkedIn opening pages and reading about batteries. And uh, and my wife will look at me and know what I'm doing. It kind of just a look of disappointment. Yeah. Um, and that seeped down into... What I don't think at the time when I made the transition, I fully appreciated was just how different this ecosystem is, this mm -hmm. clean tech and early stage yeah. uh, uh, ecosystem. And so my love for batteries has then since, I think, spread to, to anything clean tech. And then more specifically, drilling down the surface, but behind the surface on, on an idea, right? And whether that be insect protein is one of my things that I love. <laughs> Can't help but, but learn more about um, uh, all sorts of these weird and wacky things, but not just 
throw away, okay, how weird is that? But actually yeah. trying to look at the carbon math and saying, oh, actually, that's a really good idea. And, yeah. uh, and maybe it could have some potential. And I want to learn more about that. Yeah, my wife has a particular look as soon as I start talking about such things that says, okay, I'll... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll change we're the subject an odd now. Bunch. <laughs> yeah. Talking about the tech. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about the uh, the technology of uh, of Lena. So you said, obviously, you spoke to the technical founders because clearly that they asked many startups had you know very strong technical capabilities, but not the commerciality that you've brought in. So w- where were they? Where are they? Let's talk a little bit about the technology that you have. Yeah, so... Again, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't start with the solution rather than the uh, sorry with the problem rather than the solution. Yeah. Uh, the problem is not uh, that profound. I think many of the listeners and you yourself will recognize imminently that uh, renewable sources of generation like solar are intermittent. They're shaped the wrong way uh, against how we like to use energy. Mm-hmm. The fundamental problem, though, is that today's energy storage technologies like lithium is too expensive to shift large periods of that energy in and around the day. So what Lena has done in developing this solid state sodium battery is bring the cost point down sufficiently, and that's really driven by the raw materials, Mm -hmm. to the point where, okay, bulk shifting longer durations of energy becomes economically viable all around the world. And then the periphery benefits are the fact that it's an inherently safe battery, it's a lower carbon battery. But that's the, the mission, so to speak. At the point where I joined, uh, Lena had really got to proof of concept yep. in, a, in a small scale and proof of concept of a, a sodium battery. And they were at that moment where they could do all sorts with, with the technology. They could make take various different directions. Yep. They could have even said, okay, let, let's try and f- see if this tech fits with, with automotives. Um, but, but really it was coming in and understanding, okay, let's look at the the stationary storage landscape. Let's look at energy storage as a whole. Let's look at the benefits of this wonderful technology that you've developed and how do we pair the two up into the the most acute pain point in this market? Mm -hmm. And then we can grow from there, right? Um, And the, the technology itself, one thing unique about Lena is our innovation is not the chemistry set in there. Okay. It's taking this wonderfully stable chemistry set originally developed back in the, the 1970s and then commercialized of all places out of Derby. Okay. Uh, but it's taking this old chemistry set, which is great, but forgotten about. And the, the technical founders, they all had their background in fuel cells. And what okay. they said was, okay, we now know how to do things with ceramics and we know how to manufacture ceramics in a certain way that we could combine it with this old forgotten chemistry set and really unlock its potential, but most importantly, make it far more manufacturable. And that that's really in a nutshell what Lena is doing. So it's far more focused on product development and engineering yeah. than necessarily trying different uh, chemistry set and cathode blends, chasing side reactions in in uh, in glove boxes for years and years right. and years. So in terms of the suite, well, you touched on that. And I, I saw a lovely graph this morning uh, that posted that uh, in globally, we now generating more solar power than coal power at last. Uh, and again, that, that that point is passed, and we all know that solar is, is transitioning. So the storage is the problem, as you, as you highlight. Talk about your sweet spot in terms of duration, because again, there's a lot of talk around obviously flow, which has been on and off and, and, and has come to the fore o- over years and hopefully is now becoming better for the longer duration stuff. Um, and actually lithium ion decreasing in cost and increasing energy density is all the good stuff, but still, you know, for relatively short durations and and for use cases. So what's the sweet spot in terms of, I guess, duration and what's the sweet spot in terms of market for for Lena? uh, Lithium tends to be economic right now up until four hours, Mm -hmm. more or less. And then the economics drop off because to extend the duration of a lithium ion system, it's pretty much linear in terms of cost. So you double the duration, you double yep. the cost, more or less. Uh, and so that's why before f- beyond four hours, your revenue stream is getting diluted, but your costs are continuing to be linear and it just doesn't make sense anymore. And then flow batteries is a good example of how you can do things differently, where f- to add duration onto a flow battery costs a fraction of what the initial yep. capex costs because you're adding tankage, literally. Um, but the flip side of that is because you have to spend so much on the power conversion side of things mm-hmm. is that they really don't become economic until much longer durations, typically around 10 to 10 12 to hours, yeah, yeah. Uh, based, based on what I've seen. And so it leaves this gap between four hours and, and 10 or 12 hours. And that is a theoretical gap, but the, the practical gap there, why that's relevant is that if you have any grid connected solar, what you really want to be doing to maximize your revenue of your storage is discharging it twice. You're yep. going to take the most abundant solar in the middle of the day, shift that 
to the afternoon peak, right? In a lot of emerging markets around the world, people are coming home, turning on air conditioning, and it drives a peak in demand after sunset. But then you're also going to want to use that battery again overnight. You're going to charge on your base load, wind or solar, and shift that back into it. It's a lesser peak, but there's still a morning peak yep. as everyone wakes up. And so that's the, the market need we're solving for. And then in terms of scale, it really comes it comes down to the fact that electrochemical storage, like batteries, like our, our cells, they're modular. So we can really start, uh, we can provide a product at a kilowatt hour scale, which is stuff like rooftop solar, mm -hmm. uh, in theory, residential, uh, although that's not where we're focused right now, and then expand up into to larger CNI scale and utility scale products. Okay. Uh, and we're testing our first uh kilowatt hour scale, so 10 kilowatt hour scale type of system that would be perfect for, for rooftop solar right now. Right, excellent. So in terms of that point of, of TRL level, where, where is the company in terms of its commercialization and, and, and its journey? So company was originally founded in 2017, but that was really just to get the patents in place. And we have some, some really wonderful patents, uh, but really mobilized in 2019. Yeah. And so since then, we've gone and uh, taken original button cell concept type uh, activities out of the lab. Last year, we uh, hit TRL6, uh, but more importantly, we demonstrated our first system. So this mm -hmm. was plug and play kind of full energy storage systems that included your battery cells, your battery management system, the thermal management, okay. all of that together. And we did that with uh, independent academic partners, independent commercial partners, but it was a dememonstration. Mm -hmm. This year we're talking about commercial pilot uh, pilot demonstrations towards right. the end of this year at that 10 kilowatt hour scale, which actually becomes a product intense scale. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's always difficult when you're on these journeys and there's often these shiny opportunities that come along and obviously the growth of, of e-mobility is, is clearly a, bit a shiny opportunity for many people. And we've seen recently BYD and Cattle bringing sodium uh, batteries to, to the vehicle market. Is that a, a, a plus or a negative from your perspective, just in terms of the attention that sodium is now you know, generally a viable technology and a proven technology? It's, it's a very personal question. So in, when we talked about going through that, that transition, I was about at the point where I said, okay, yeah, sodium has real opportunity here. I was talking to the family and saying, I think I'm going to do this. And it's during that summer that CATL came out and announced they were going to do a sodium ion battery. And so I had <laughs> this moment where I was like, well, on the one hand, I can say, well, that's it. <laughs> no, no point going down here. The, the, you know, the, yeah. the incumbents are going to take a hold of this market. Or more to what you were alluding to, actually what that's done is just validate that something that was quite an academic concept yeah. has real commercial uh, opportunity here. Um, at, but then it becomes extremely important to know what you're, you're aiming to do with your tech. Yeah. right? And so when we look at a lot of the moves right now in sodium space, it is with forms of the chemistry, uh, which are different to what we're doing, where they're intercalating the, the sodium ions, and it's in forms that are probably more suitable to, to EVs and to small mm -hmm. electric vehicles right now. And we will see over time a variety of the different types of sodium battery permeate into those different spots in the market, so long as they've been able to find those those pain points, right? Yeah. It, it probably won't be the te best tech wins. I think that's something I've learned in this yeah, yeah, tech space. Yeah, right? just beta um, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. It, it's probably who has found a real great point to grow from in the market, a real yeah. uh, stress point. Let's talk about that as well, because I should say the, 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 the the problem is in some ways global, but it's also, you know, things like air conditioning are more prevalent in certain parts of the world than others. And I know you've been doing some work in India recently. In terms of internationalization, are there areas that are a greater focus for you at the moment? Yeah. So the opportunity is global, as you say. As a startup with limited finite resource, we need to make sure we're working on the places where we can make the most impact in the shortest amount of time. Yeah. We're gonna be most disruptive. And India is one of those places where several things to come together. So the macros are the best in the world when it comes to to medium duration storage or, right. or plus four hours because there's around 400 gigawatts of of solar expected to be built and that's essentially the backbone of the grid yeah. they're building uh, and and couple that with demand like you say for air conditioning which is booming and is, is a large source of the growth all happening after sunset so the macros are there uh, then you have a lot of government support which is key Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of government support to diversify away from incumbent technologies. And then the final part is actually that the heat in India and in a lot of these growth markets around the world for solar 
is really prohibitive to deploying lithium ion. Right. Lithium ion doesn't like to be hot, and you're going to spend a lot of capital and then a lot of, cooling. of cost cooling it. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things our technologies has a uh, technology has a great advantage over. Yeah. And that's one of uh, the talk I was doing in Berlin recently was around these convergence issues where it's not just one factor or one technology. It's it has to be a convergence of a number of things which actually make that a real pain point solvable. Yes. And uh, yeah, we all know that uh, an increasingly warming world requires an increasingly large amount of air conditioning. So addressing these things is uh, is important. Let's talk a little bit about the UK, uh, being a UK-based startup mm -hmm. and the support that, that is here. Uh, we all know about the, the British Vault story. Uh, and also on the backdrop of that, we've seen in the Inflation Reduction Act in the US tempting a lot of European companies to, to be there because of the incentive structure. Obviously, the EU has, has replicated or in the process of replicating some form of support mechanism to, to try and keep those organizations here. The UK is a bit, without getting too political, <laughs> what, what would you like to see or hope to see supporting organizations like Lena in the UK? It's, it's at this point I wish I had one of those pre-written <laughs> cards that yeah. would keep me in there. Um, so yeah, a lot of the discussion right now is on building gigafactories. So that's the manufacturing capacity that's going to produce over a gigawatt hour per year of, of primarily lithium-ion cells yeah. right now. What we're observing is that a lot of countries have come to the conclusion that this is a strategic priority and that securing a domestic si supply chain for batteries and for EVs is of importance. And then whilst I think a lot of people are surprised, but we shouldn't be surprised, is that a lot of other countries came to the same conclusion, yeah. right? that they also wanted to do the exact same thing. And it only takes one or two more steps where it becomes a bit of an arms race. And let's be honest, yeah. that's what it is in terms of you've got multiple nations trying to compete for the same thing. And therefore, one of the cards that will be played is support and incentives. Yeah. And that is just the reality of, of the, the state of affairs. We shouldn't be surprised. And also, once you've gone down that path, once the horse is bolted, so to speak, it's almost impossible to imagine a world where you are successful in domesticating manufacturing capacity without some level of yeah. incentive, right? The reality is if others are offering it, any private company is going to be obligated to their shareholders to look for, to the best yeah. place to, to, to grow value. So that's where we are right now, and I don't think we should be surprised by it. What I would say is that we should also look further ahead. So we shouldn't just be chasing um, manufacturing capacity. We also need to be looking upstream. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm just focused on the factory to build the lithium ion cells. You also need to then look at where you're getting the lithium from, where you're refining the lithium. There's a bit going on in the UK, yeah. but most of the discussion is not on that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would say also another option is to look beyond lithium. Uh, a little bit of uh, talking my own book up there, but uh, it makes sense. And then the, the second piece is back onto what the UK does really well, core innovation. Yeah. That is also a key towards getting the cost down to, to enable manufacturing. Because if you look at the way costs, the way the price of lithium has evolved over the past 10 years, the majority of the reduction has actually come from the fact that the energy density of the batteries yep. have increased. So you need less cells per system. And so you don't, the, chasing scale is not the only route to, to commerciality here. Yeah. And making sure we're still nurturing a strong portfolio of innovation is going to be key. Yeah, and that's something we've always done this phenomenally well. And, and, and again, that's touched on another point, actually, because a lot of companies in your shoes could either keep the IP and license to technology, you could subcontract as many do, or you obviously could build your own sort of ecosystem as Northolp, for example, are, are doing. Is there a, without breaking any commercialities, is there a strategy with, with Lena in terms of the path forward there? So we know what we're good at and we want to stay in our lane. And if I go back to what was the core innovation we brought, it was that, that knowledge of ceramics. Mm -hmm. So long-term, we want to stay in that lane and we want to move towards a, a world where we're partnering for a lot of the manufacturing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean licensing out. And I think a lot of early stage battery companies will have, have problems trying to go down a licensing yep. route. It's probably a little bit naive to think you can license a new technology in a world where there's abundant availability of 10-year warranted lithium ion cells at, at your disposal. Um, but we want to make sure we're moving towards that world and to do that, the two things we're doing is one, we're bringing in manufacturing expertise. And so right. we appointed an advisor from uh, previously from British Vault uh, who can provide that, she, she can provide that 
core expertise that we don't have as, as mostly scientists. I speak not for myself, but for the rest <laughs> of the team. Um, and the other thing we're doing is then validating that commercial model out in the, in the marketplace. Because it's very convenient for me to go to investors or to potential customers and saying, well, we're going we're gonna to deal with manufacturing by partnering up. And what we've observed is our cells look quite different to your traditional yep. lithium-ion cell, but they've been designed for mass manufacturing in, in mind. And we've been working with a, a German tier one automotive manufacturer called Koenig Metall, who've never made battery cells, but understand the opportunity, having come from a traditional ICE background, understand the opportunity and said, okay, let's have a look at how our manufacturing methods compare because we, we recognize the opportunity, the overlap, yeah. went through a bit of feasibility to say, okay, actually a lot of these processes, although they haven't been proven in the battery industry. They yeah. have been proven in other, yeah. other sectors. And so let's leverage that and leverage the existing know-how, the existing infrastructure to scale our own business capital efficiently. And that's the, the route down. And just the final bit, um, I'll keep it brief, but the final bit is then looking again to, to, to look not just at the automotive industry, but mm -hmm. other sectors who, who we think can really industrialize our DNA. Yeah, yeah. And that's earlier in the year we, we teamed up with Halliburton, which is not your typical... Partner, sure. Yeah, right? I but they, surprised myself. Um, uh, but but we think there's a real opportunity where where there's a give and take where we're getting that industrial DNA in our in ourselves, moving stuff out of the lab into a more manufacturing mentality. Yeah. But likewise, we're helping the industry move towards its scientific based goals. Right. If they they really want to make a difference and they want to deliver on what they're saying they're going to do, we think we can not only play a part in offering the product itself, but also just an understanding on this yeah. on this energy storage space. I think the other thing that's really interesting, when we started this or I started getting involved in in the battery sector four, five, six years ago, it was all around stationary storage and mainly utility and then I moved towards working the likes of Zona and, and sort of residential. But everything was around stationary storage essentially. And then EVs almost came from nowhere, you know, in, in the broader sense and have dominated both the, the take up of batteries, of course, but also a lot of the news uh, and airspace. And, and yet, fundamental to all of this, including charging EV, clearly is the grid and the ability to, to generate and use power as is required. So it, I think it's good that there's now a transition back towards talking about stationary storage. What, what are your thoughts on, on, I guess, the broad revolution of stationary storage and things like the capacity of the grid and this, you know, the renewables transition rather than the mobility transition for a moment in terms of broadly support, obviously a place where Lena have chosen to play. Yep. But also, I guess, perhaps taking a slightly broader market view of, of that, if you would, what, what do you see the next few years looking like in terms of the stationary storage markets? It's definitely market specific. So if we look at where batteries are deployed right now, let's start with the UK. Uh, what the batteries are doing on the UK grid is not what you would typically expect batteries to, to be doing. Mm -hmm. They're not shifting large amounts of solar throughout yeah, the day. Yeah. What they're doing is providing ancillary services, which really just keep the, the, the grid humming along. They're yeah. providing frequency response. That's how they're generating most of their revenue. And, and the UK can be a little bit misleading then as a, uh, as a looking glass into yeah. how some of the other markets will emerge. Yeah. And, that, and that really comes back to the fundamentals of the UK grid has built up over many, many years and it has invested in the standby capacity and the flexibility with connections to our neighboring grids to manage upsets in, in generation. Yep. And so there's a, a lesser role for batteries to play here. And ultimately, it will become a price sensitive role as in, is it cheaper to put a battery, which is four hours or six hours of duration? Or is it going to be cheaper to, to, to pay someone to be on standby? Or is it going to be cheaper to import yep. from, um, from mainland Europe? In other places, so going back to India, it's not the same case whatsoever, right? In, in that market, you've got a grid which is growing in real time with solar without yeah. the luxury of oodles of capacity uh, on standby. And so that's where we see a much different role where not only are renewable gener is renewable generation getting adopted much quicker, but because it's being adopted much quicker and proportionately, it's becoming a large, larger and larger element yep. of supply. We're needing that those longer durations of storage, right? So it, I didn't quite answer your question, but I think it, it, I'm, what I'm trying to highlight is it is very market-specific market specific. Yeah, yeah. What, what we're going to see in the mix. But in general, more renewable penetration means you are going to need a shift towards longer durations. Yeah, yeah. How about the, the, the CNI markets? You touched on that before, which clearly markets you know behind the, me, in front of me, to, is a conversation that's been going on for quite some time. But we're starting to see, I'm starting to see more use cases or more project rather than use cases in the CNI space. Absolutely. You, you touched on that. So, absolutely. I, I tend to agree. And 
the the typical use case for CNI behind the meter though is that bulk shifting, and that's mm-hmm. where the economics do tend to be challenged, right? Yeah. I think most folks, if they're looking to get into battery investments, are preferring to go front of meter grid connected yeah. and just getting paid primarily on on ancillary service markets. Again, if I switch over to India, one of the really interesting use cases out there for the CNI uh, market is data centers. Mm -hmm. And not just data centers in terms of backup power, which is where batteries have historically been deployed, but if you're a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google and you want to build a data center and you've got science-based targets for your uh, ESG goals, you're going to have to, in your RFP, say, I want X percent of renewable power and uh, feeding this data center, yeah. right? And so if you're a developer, you can put a bunch of solar panels down, and you can put a data center, but you're going to need something in the middle to, yeah. to make that all work, right? Yeah. And again, that's where we're seeing a lot of CNI demand come out of that, that right. space. In terms of the the, the journey forward for, for, for you, obviously you're going to be in the Eco Summit next week, I think, pitching and, and looking for an A round. So fundraising is always a, a challenge, A, personally, because again, as you say, you've come from a corporate with a very brief, and now it's another one of the hats that you're wearing, so we can touch on that. But also the fact that, like I said, the, the noise around sodium recently is, is, I think, in many ways a plus point that people are actually starting to say, yes, this is a genuine thing. But there is so much noise in storage and batteries and so much still, I think, yearning towards the, the mobility side. How are you finding your initial sort of a conversations with investors and the, the broader ecosystem around, yeah, just the the the, the interest in, in what Lena are doing? The conversation is definitely f- focused on a, a product market fit mm-hmm. type discussion. I think several years ago, a lot of people were coming with maybe a button cell that had done yeah. something once and saying, I can overtake this complete, I, I can take over the complete market, I can replace lithium. And, and selling this grandiose dream of there's going to be a binary shift away from lithium to something yeah. else. Now the market is, I think, uh, far more aware, and we are certainly far more aware that actually what you need to do is find those pinch points, yeah. right? And so most of the discussions we have right from the get-go, you start from from a million miles in the sky and you narrow down. And the more you can narrow, the more points you get, it feels. Yeah. Whereas previously, you didn't want you didn't want to sell yourself short. You know, oh, I don't want to say we could never go into cars because maybe one day I can and that will, yeah, that yeah. will extend that, that total addressable market this much. But now I think if you know who your customer is and you know why they need your technology and why they're screaming for it, yeah. you, you get a lot of points on that. Uh, and that tends to drive a lot of the rest of the discussion. And then you get onto tech, and then you get into the data room, and then you get into the, the, the yeah. details. But it's that focus that's really critical, isn't it? In, I don't know if you saw the episode with Yuri Levine around the, the as you say, it's so easy to look at the shiny stuff, and all we can do it, and we can do this, and we can do this, and you know, features and all that kind of just get to the core of what you do. Do you know what, funnily enough, in our, in our market, because Hyperion obviously focus exclusively in the clean tech set, always have. And um, there's a US organization that we, we partner with sometimes, and uh, they, they love the phrase that uh, it's not your it's your niche that will make you rich because we say niche obviously yeah. it doesn't work niche make you rich doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> your niche will make you rich but to the point you know having that focus is really what stands aside isn't it? just do what you do fundamentally well and showing a, a a dose of humility right I think it's easy to forget that if you are a a clean tech VC investor, right? You've been told way too many times that someone's got a safer, sustainable, higher performing, cheaper battery, right? Yeah. You probably see that uh, multiple times per week. Uh, what they may not have heard is, hey, we found X, Y, and Z in this market that isn't potentially not close to home, um, but here are the fundamentals. And this is these are the signposts we're seeing that is, is spelling out disruptive potential. And so I don't want to give away all the secrets, right? But one of those anecdotes for us would be the fact that in India, a grid that already needs a ton of storage, yeah. there's only 34 megawatt hours deployed right now, which is a, a single small European project. And Greenfield Investments are going into pumped hydro, which is a good technology, yeah. don't get me wrong, but you're talking about pumping reservoirs full of water uphill and downhill, ultra scale, it's not a convenient solution. Right? Yeah. And so you start to pick up these, these anecdotes and you realize, mm-hmm. okay, what, what, what is the market really needing? And how can how are we placed to disrupt in it from timing, from product market fit, and all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what does the next two or three years look like from Lena's perspective? So we uh, we will close this Series A. Hopefully, you know, I don't know when this is going live, but uh, I would love it to be in a matter of weeks. weeks. But um, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we close that. The primary role of that Series A is to do two things. One, we you, you held up that cell. We're going to continue to work on the cell to make sure we have the most disruptive potential. 
And that means making it slightly larger so that we've got the most headroom against incumbent mm -hmm. technologies and other emerging competing technologies. So we get uh, build that into the product development cycle. The other uh, large pun um, chunk of the Series A is to build a pilot manufacturing facility okay. in Lancaster. And the, the role of that pilot manufacturing facility is to to extract most of the core scale-up risk, yep. so demonstrate semi-automation, demonstrate making these cells not in glove boxes, yep. to set us up for a Series B where we can then raise sufficient money to build our first commercial pilot line, yep. which would be a 100 megawatt hour per year pilot line. And that's where the magic of Lena comes because, because our cost advantage comes from the raw materials. We don't have to chase scale, and we yeah. believe even at a 100 megawatt hour per year scale, we can become profitable. And so it's within arm's reach, and, and now it's about probably going faster and harder <laughs> and, and delivering on all that and, yeah. and trying to uh, take care of ourselves at the same time. So we'll, we'll get this out pretty quickly, and uh, in view of the fact you'll be pitching in, uh, in Berlin at uh, Eco Summit, are you able to share what sort of ticket size you're looking at? So we're looking for a 15.15 million mm. pound round. Okay. Cool. Well, let's hope that uh, that happens uh, quickly because I'm looking for a trip up to Lancaster to see the site in operation, which should uh, which will be great. Um, going back to the original point of your transition, so and again, I saw you more so. So now, you know, typically having, I guess, corporately at least, grown up selling stuff, and now you're pitching for money, which is kind of selling stuff but but different. So how are you finding again this uh, uh, juggling of of one hand, still having those commercial conversations and also then having these fundraising conversations going on? I think in a big corporate, one thing they're very good at is whipping you into shape, <laughs> is in you get a lot of feedback yeah. from a lot of people and the expectation is that you respond very quickly to that feedback. And I think pitching is, is very similar, right? You have to adapt to what people are interested in and you may have the shiniest pitch deck that you may have even spent money on uh, developing that looks really nice. But if everyone ends up talking about duration of storage, for yeah. example, you just need to, to to make sure that's front and center to what you're doing. Uh, so I think it's a lot about listening and I think working in a big corporate helped with that. Um, and then in terms of, of the next step is, is a bit more in a personal stage is you have to recognize that there's a lot of funds that you are going to be outside their thesis on. Mm -hmm. Right, a fund sets its thesis and it knows what it wants to invest in, and there will be a lot of funds that just are incompatible with you, and it's it's natural human instinct to try and convince them otherwise, yep. to, to try and convince them just how special yeah, this yeah. tech is because you're so passionate about it, but it's a waste of time. Right, mm -hmm. what you need to do is talk to the right person and the right funds who you know based on previous investments or based on explicit discussions with them that yeah, you yeah. know you're in scope. Right, and and it can be rather abrasive, right? You start a, a call with a VC for the first time, and you're like, "Well, what's your thesis?" <laughs> it, it feels somewhat rude, but I think almost the corporate, um, uh, uh, the the intensity of corporate life sets you up Ooh, quite well yeah. to to be able to handle that and not and not take it too personally. Because the other side is then there are going to be funds that you're within thesis in, but for whatever reason, maybe they've made a recent investment that's a bit too close to this. They're yeah. going to say no. And they say, it's very easy to take that no as a personal, I don't like what you're doing. It's usually not, right? Yeah, absolutely. Again, to go back to the conversation with Yuri, as he calls it the journey of a thousand no's or a hundred no's, actually. So you had to get to a hundred no's to be able to get a yes. And like you say, sometimes it is you're just knocking on the wrong door. And absolutely. sometimes the door is the right door, but you know, there's there's something in the door. And you know, there's there's something that they've invested in recent, as you say, or their fund's just closing, or whatever it might happen to be. So it's it's definitely uh, not for the faint-hearted no. fundraising. And I think I think also you want to when you have that good fit, it's always better to have offered up what you are in a very transparent way, right? Making sure you're, who you're talking to understands the risk, understand the business model, and so as you progress those those discussions, because it's going to take what twelve meetings, yeah. fifteen meetings to the point of which you're seriously ready to make, to make some sort of decision. Um, if you've put everything out on the table and sold to your highest degree on, on stage one and then you're walking it back for the next 10 meetings, that's not going to, no one's going to yeah, yeah. enjoy that, right? I think something I've learned is just to, to be very transparent and open about who you are, what your targets are, what you're going to do with the money, yeah. why, how you're going to make money out of their money for them, yeah, yeah. Um, and then take it from there, right? I think some people lose track of the obvious thing that exactly that's the point of a VC, their existence is to make money on money. So uh, people often lose sight of that. We've got this really cool thing you can be involved with. Well, yeah, but does it make money? Yeah. And it's, sometimes it is that harsh, really, because again, we all, we're all in the ecosystem, I think, passionate about moving the, the dial forward on what we're doing in terms of the energy transition. 
but ultimately we all have a part to play and the VC's part is very specifically to, to you know, continue making money that can be reinvested essentially. So I think some people yeah, pitch on the pitch on the, the 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 great tech or without really looking at does this solve the sufficient problem or is there a sufficient commercial opportunity? And I think I've seen a lot of pitches that were just like and <laughs> yeah, and we're all in a, from a personal perspective as well, right? I yeah. mean, ultimately, we're we're not working at charities, right? What we're trying to do is is build successful businesses, and and yes, one cornerstone of all of us is going to be we're going to do something that has a positive climate impact, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be clean tech, and that's what's drawn us into this space. But that can't trump the fact that you need to make a, a successful business model out of what no, you're no, doing. No, no, absolutely. We're running out of time. I just wanted to touch on something which is close to my heart. When I started in the clean tech back in 2007, it was very much almost like a cottage industry when we started our solar business. And it was very much, it really was a us versus them in terms of you know oil and gas and, and renewables. And, and, and increasingly, that's changing. We do still see a lot of greenwashing, obviously, from the other side. Yet, to really get to where we need to get to, I believe, we need these companies on side how are you seeing having had a foot in both camps the 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 i guess the convergence from from the oil and gas side of thinking of clean tech beyond just an esg thing or a, a greenwashing thing well for one they're setting targets right and i think especially looking at some of the more old school type oil and gas now energy majors typically when they set targets they, they intend to deliver on them, right? And my, now we're talking about science-based targets. So yeah. I would take the ambition at face value to say, okay, there's a target there. And then the second step is, is not so much for a company like Lena to second guess that or to look for reasons why they shouldn't get involved. It really comes back to, okay, to what extent is there a mutual win-win from teaming up for, for considering it? Yeah. And... For me, I think there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of industrial knowledge in that sector that can be applied to clean tech. And certainly there's a lot of scale, not only from a deployment capability, yeah, yeah. right? There's a ton of sites around the world that yeah. could be retrofitted with renewables or uh, storage could be added to it. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity for companies like ours to, to tap into that. Uh, and then on the flip side, there's there's a huge opportunity for those companies to, to reach their targets via us. Yep. And again, I mentioned earlier, that comes via the product itself, you know, delivering our product yep. and deploying it within their networks, but also from uh, the understanding and knowledge of the sector. You could, uh, I've been in the big corporate world, right? And, and the top boss could say, I want you to, to write a report on energy storage. And there'll be some desktop analysis, really good stuff, I'm sure. Plenty of citations to Wood, Woodmac and, and uh, all the consultancy firms. But you spend, you know, an hour with someone who's in, in, in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> in it and living and breathing it and knows their competition better than than anyone else. You, you get that insight in a much more acute fashion, right? And I think yeah. that that's where you naturally then have an opportunity to work together. And and yeah. we're not we're not afraid to admit that um, we we think we can gain something and we think we have something to offer in this space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. Um, you, you're a nerd, as so many of us who, who listen to the podcast or, or, you know, or host the podcast, indeed, in terms of uh, not just batteries, but the, the sector as a whole. In your journey from where you were to where you are, are there any books or maybe more things that have particularly inspired you? Or, or, or I'm always looking for book recommendations, as you can see, but anything that's really helped you in your journey or, or really excited you that we can share with the audience? Um, I'm sure you've read it. I'm sure most of your audience has read it. But uh, definitely, if you want inspiring and and to get you through the the troughs of <laughs> <laughs> clean tech, lift off uh, the, the book about yeah. SpaceX through the first four launches, it is a great one just to... Um, to, to remind you just how big the opportunity is and yeah. and why it's worth spending a lot of time, uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears to, to <clears throat> get your tech out into the market. Um, so that's you. That's probably the one I'd say right now really Keeps resonates. you going in the darker days. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Well, we'll make sure we share uh, some links to, to that along with some links to obviously the uh, Lena and the, the technology. Um, obviously reach out to, to well, particularly if you're in a VC looking to invest. Um, for now, thanks very much for coming to join us and uh, looking forward to seeing Lena grow and expand over the next few years. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you.